John Clemson, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Happy to be here, John. I'm really excited to have the chance to talk with you today. Uh, you, you have expertise that you know is, is a little bit outside the norm for what I usually will interview people about on the podcast, but it's super relevant and important uh, to organizations. And that is, you know, how do we use language as a tool to inspire others? How um, how do we better message? How do we better convey information? How do we better and more effectively communicate? And that is essential to all of us in you know, every walk of life, uh, but particularly you know, within organizations, we're trying to, to lead with impact. So I'm really excited to have the chance to uh, explore um, some of this with you today. Um, as I get started, I just wanna briefly share with the listeners a little bit about John. Uh, John Clemson, he is an author, a speaker, and a coach who guides leaders and executives to inspire others by crafting and delivering precise language. And I love that focus on precise language. Um, to John, it's all about the language. And uh, John's concepts have been adopted by international companies ranging from Indeed.com to American Express Travel to Simon's uh, Barcelona based uh, Wallbox EV Chargers and and really uh, is just an expert in the area of the power of language. So welcome, John, to the podcast. And is there anything else you would like to, to share about yourself before we launch in? Um, yes, I really like Cinnamon Toast Crunch cereal. And I think that uh, people need to understand that so that they can relate to my message. Uh, okay, that's, that's wonderful. And I also enjoy sugary cereals of, of different varieties. I will admit Cinnamon Toast Crunch is not my favorite among the sugary cereals. No uh, kidding. But it is a good one, and so, <laughs> so I applaud you. <laughs> well, I wonder, do we like the cereal, or do we just enjoy the cereal milk once we're done? Uh, that is also a, an excellent question. And I know, for, for example, we, we try to not have a lot of sugar cereal. I have, I have six young children, so we try to keep you know, the cereals we get you know, have a, a, a kind of a maximum sugar uh, per serving amount you know my wife kind of has sure. a standard and so we don't get sugar cereal all that often but um, I was on a trip this last week and my wife bought uh, tricks for oh, the kids yeah. while I was gone and there were still some left when I got back and I was so excited um, and like you said not just for the cereal itself but for the milk at the bottom of the bowl um, it was wonderful so we're all children at heart at, le at least I hope we are yeah absolutely absolutely uh, well, John, um, maybe we can just start off with uh, like why language? Where did your passion for language come from, um, and how did you really get into um, this this line of work and really trying to help um, people deliver on the power of language? Well, uh, as are some of the most fascinating and wonderful experiences in life, it kind of came to me, came at me, unexpectedly. And when I say unexpectedly, I didn't expect it. But when I made the realization of it, everyone around me just kind of nodded like, yeah, we kind of knew that already about you. And what, what occurred, John, was one of those great intersections, one of those great flashpoints that open up a window in your mind to things that to, again, people around us, it may be obvious to them, it may be clear to them, or when we articulate it, they may say, you know what? Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense about you. What had happened was that since the age of nine years old, I have been not only involved in music, but practiced music, studied music, listened to music, performed music. And over the many years since that time, I have explored and, and challenged myself to learn to play a variety of different instruments. And I started on the, the snare drum, and it was a great thing back then because when I was that age, someone with the level of energy that I had needed something to do. <laughs> and I was one of four children, and the fact my parents were just thrilled with, I would sit with the rubber pad and the two drumsticks for an inordinate amount of time practicing. And I wasn't told to practice. I wasn't told I had to practice. I wanted to because I knew that by the time I got to the music teacher a week later, that that teacher had an expectation of me that I should have learned and practiced something. And they, something clicked within me that said that there's something about this, this 
this regimen, this routine that after three or four weeks and then three or four months and certainly three or four years, I could sense, I could see, and I could demonstrate the advancement, the, 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 the further facility that I had to work with the instruments. So I, I went from playing snare drum to playing snare and bass drum in the orchestra to being shown tuned percussion. So I was taught how to read music and I played xylophone, marimba, chimes, timpani, and I developed an ear. And the next thing you knew, it was two and a half years later, and I was introduced to the drum set. And in sixth grade, I performed a drum solo at our jazz concert, and it, that opened up a whole new window. So for many, many years, uh, I've been, a, been deeply passionate about music. Now, I get into the professional world. I, leave, uh, I served the, the Navy for four years. I meet my future and now current wife of 36 years. I meet her six months before I get out of the Navy. And I find that as being a young married person, I need to make a living. A friend of mine introduces me to a sales job. And I start getting involved in recruiting and people in a variety of different roles in finance companies and insurance companies. And I find, and I don't realize this very early, but I find that one of the things about being a musician is that you become a disciplined and focused listener. You must be able to listen well to the other people in the band, the orchestra, the duo, the trio, whatever, so that you can create harmony. And that word has such deep resonance for me in my relationships, in what I write about. And as I said, you know, that one of those intersections, one of those flashpoints only occurred, John, about, about 10 years ago when I realized that my passion for music was an intersection with my passion for language because not not only had I studied music my entire life, once I got into junior high school in the New York, uh, the state of New York, Long Island's uh, school system, I had displayed a facility and, a, and an ability to um, adopt language. So they gave me the choice of studying German, French, Spanish, or Russian. Now, of course, I chose Russian. You've seen my last name. I thought we were Russian. Turns out we're close relatives, which I won't get into, but, you know, because I don't want anyone saying, oh, well, you know, I don't like that country, whatever. My grandfather was born in, in part of what used to be the Soviet Union. I studied Russian from seventh through 11th grade. And when I was in the Navy, those records showed up when I was up for promotion. And they asked me why I, and I was in during the, the 80s, during the Reagan era, and I was asked why I wasn't, why I had not applied to be a translator. So I've always been interested in languages. I've always been a bit of a Europhile. And over the years, I've studied Russian, French, German, Italian, French. And of course, the joke is I still struggle with English. And I found early on that we cannot learn basic conversational of any language without learning something about the culture. So all of this is welling up in me. All of this is being kind of woven into my DNA until about 10 years ago when I had that flashpoint where I had that intersection that said, wait a minute, you're teaching people how to sell. You're writing books on how to sell. What the undercurrent here is, is that we want to create language that, that moves us forward, that creates harmony and opportunity to collaborate. And language, the, 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 the epiphany for me was that language, all language at its core is music. And that launched a whole new, it, it was like it opened up a window, a, 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 sorry, a wing in my home that I didn't even know was there. And it was full of wonder and fascination and study and discovery. And that has fueled me and it has fed me in deep and meaningful ways. And it has really deeply impacted what I write, what I speak, and, and how I coach. Awesome background. Uh, that, and that's really interesting about both the music and the language. Uh, my background, and I, I don't have nearly as much background in language as you do, but, <laughs> uh, but I did uh, live for three years in South Korea, and I've lived for times in China. Um, Indonesia and and spent a lot of time in Asia and so 
you know, I, I'm, I'm quite good at Korean uh, and I dabbled in other Asian languages. And, uh, and that, that's what I found too. I, I don't play instruments, but I, I sing and I, 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 I've always performed in, in choirs and whatnot uh, since a young age and still to today. And uh, I, I felt like the same thing, like it, languages is largely connected to music um, with Asian languages, particularly Korean. It's, it's also largely mathematical, which is interesting. Um, and it, it's just, it's, it, it feeds into a lot of how we, um, how we can understand interacting with people and culture definitely plays into every single language, just like you said. Um, so, so how do we use language? I mean, with that background, how do we use language as a tool to inspire others in organizations? Well, here's the thing. Everyone I have ever met uh, has a fascination with and a hope to participate in the future. And one of the things that I teach enterprise salespeople is a, a process I call moving conversations forward. And that statement is to us language geeks, it is referred to as a present tense perfect, meaning that because it begins with a verb, it already has action in it. And if our goal, our intent, and our mindset is that we are moving conversations forward, there's a very specific fine line distinction between the mindset of what the purpose of the conversation is and where it can go. So if you have a mindset about the purpose of the conversation and where it can go, what you do is you remove any sense of a need to create a transaction. What you do is you make an impression that you're there to participate in a relationship. And that's a very different thing from traditional sales training. So in moving conversations forward, what that led me to was, okay, so let's make pretend that I need to lead a bunch of salespeople. Let's even elevate that further to I'm an executive that leads people of all different roles, engineering, marketing, purchasing. How can moving conversations forward be useful to them? Well, Number one, it's focused on the future because every, every dynamic conversation is focused on the future. Second, it is about I, what I believe, John, is every person on earth, we all have the same job description as humans and as professionals. And it is a simple one word job description, which again, this is my opinion, it is connect. When you and I connect, that means that there is some common ground. It means that there is some reverberation. There is energy that we both want to participate in and we want to repeat that experience. So if we first and foremost, our mindset is connect, build a relationship, move the conversation forward. That means that it's not so much what comes out of my mouth that's in, uh, that is important. It's what I can draw out of the other person. In, in one of my books, I, I state what I call painful truths. And one of the painful truths is that when someone hears something come out of my mouth, all they hear is an opinion. When it comes out of their own mouth, it's a fact. And you said that you have six children and you mentioned your wife. That probably applies to some conversations that have gone on in your house. Because <laughs> it certainly applies to conversations that have gone on in mine. Yeah. Well, and as you say that, a, a quick story came to mind. If you, if you would indulge me, I'll share real quick. Please. Um, so years ago, actually, this is um, when I was living in South Korea. I worked for LG Electronics in South Korea. Uh, in their corporate organizational development office. And wow. I, had, I had already lived in Korea for a couple years. Um, so I was pretty, I wouldn't say fluent, but I was pretty fluid in the language, knew the culture quite well. I was the only non-Korean in, in the office, um, in this headquarters. Um, everyone else was Korean. And, and so, you know, I, I, I fit in quite a bit because I, I knew the culture, I knew the language, but, but I also was an outsider for sure. And early on while I was there, um, uh, one of the VPs came to me and said, hey, we want you to work on this project uh, and, you know, take a couple months and then uh, report back. And the project was actually dealing with, um, with gender issues um, in the workplace. And if you know anything about the culture in Asian countries, 
you know, that's, that can be a challenging thing, but it's a tech company, you know, they, they're trying to be progressive. They're trying to figure out how can we move the needle and, and, and make things, you know, a better environment. Um, so they asked me to take on this kind of a project and tackle it. Uh, but I'm just a young guy and age really matters in terms of, uh, you know, how people perceive you in Asian countries. I was a white guy, you know, um, I was an outsider. So, you know, very quickly I realized, you know, if I just research this and I go in and I have all these recommendations, you know, they'll, they'll, um, they'll pat me on the back. They'll say good job. But the chances of them actually doing anything with what I share with them was right. pretty close to zero. So I, I decided to take on the strategy, you know, that I would basically try to ask them probing questions that would kind of force them down a path to have dialogue that would help them uncover kind of their own ideas and their own thinking about what they should do to move forward. And so right. uh, a meeting at the end of all of this, we had a meeting, it was scheduled for an hour, it ended up going on about three hours. And by the end of the meeting, they had, they had kind of self-discovered and come to the conclusion, their own conclusions about what they needed to do moving forward in action items. And I just kind of helped facilitate the process. Um, and so that wasn't what they were expecting. They were expecting me go to go in with a PowerPoint and just walk them through slides and share information, uh, have a little bit of discussion. And it really wasn't that. And I just helped facilitate. And what that experience seems to be like what you're describing with the power of listening, the power of communication and understanding the people you're interacting with and helping them come to conclusions. Um, because that's going to be more powerful than if you're just kind of spilling your own thinking on the people. Well, John, you, you touched on several things there and I'll, I'll work backward from one of the last things you said. You said that's more powerful. I read a book years ago called Power Versus Force and it, had, it was about kinetic energy, it was about psychological power, it was about influence and it's dense and it's not light reading in any way, shape or form and I'm not trying to brag. What I'm saying is that there is a fine distinction there is a huge chasm between power and force and when i work with leaders and i mean leaders of any group when i work with leaders i want them to embody power and i want them to be reluctant to exert force because i walk their people through i ask them what's the difference between power and force and i'm sure you you can imagine we get a multitude of answers what it boils down to is this power is attractive force is repellent whenever someone is being forced prodded influenced to do something that was not their idea they will resist what you did was you embodied power because you didn't make it that that exercise that experience you didn't make it about you you made it about the group and when you do that then you start to draw things out and that i think is the amazing power of this i will never forget years ago i heard a speaker by the name of Var mark victor hansen now many people may recognize him as being one of the co-founders of the the amazingly successful book series the um, chicken soup for the soul and mark victor hansen said that the word educate is a little misunderstood in america because the root word is a greek word which is educare which means to draw out the violin teacher does not insert knowledge and skill into the potential violinist it draws out, that teacher draws out the talent and draws out the ability. And in my case, because I had so much energy and so much passion that it was very clear to my teachers, well, he's, he really does go home and practice. So we're going to make it more challenging for him. And we're going to see how far we can take him. And that is, to me, that's an educator's role. How far can I take? You know, a friend of mine says that the, the student must exceed the teacher. And you said that uh, you said something very typically American in your description of the success of that event. You said, I just kind of led that no other, no other English speaking culture would use those limiters just <laughs> or kind of, Yeah. right? If you're speaking to a German, they will say, I led them through this and this is what we achieved. 
If you're speaking to a Frenchman, we went through a very specific exercise that had very clear goals and there was a deep discussion and we spent a lot of time. It'll take them nine sentences <laughs> to express exactly where we got to, but that's the French way. The French people will stand on the corner and have a conversation with for 30 minutes about nothing. Now, I have not, uh, I haven't been to Korea since I was in the Navy uh, and I didn't uh, conscious fascination with language. However, it is clear to me that you, the first thing you did, consciously or unconsciously, was you connected with those people so that they would feel safe and comfortable in expressing their ideas, in making their suggestions. And that's your opportunity in that room, in that environment, to create harmony. And you know, uh, I'm, I'm much more interested in harmony than in balance, because harmony is uh, at least three different voices that are working together to create this new and wonderful sound. And you said, well, I don't play an instrument, but I have sung. Well, John, the first instrument, first musical instrument in the history of man is the human voice. Yeah, that's right. Well. Jeremy, uh, or John, rather, sorry, <laughs> John. Okay, I'll do Jeremy if it makes you happy. <laughs> two J names. Um, John, it has really been a pleasure talking with you. I, I'm, unfortunately, we're about out of time, but we've really only scratched the surface. We so did. Per, perhaps um, I can have you back on uh, another time and we can continue the discussion. Uh, but before we close today, I want to give you a chance to share with the listeners a little bit more about how they can reach out to you and learn more about you. Simplest thing to do, and thank you for that, John. The simplest thing to do is to visit my website. It is klimshin.com, K-L-Y, M like Mary, S like Sam, H-Y-N like Nancy. You can Google John Klimshin. Uh, while I will be most of the, the returns on that Google search, you may find my son who works in the entertainment industry, who is John Klimshin III. Uh, that is the easiest and simplest way to do it. I will tell you that I will offer your audience a free chapter of one of my audiobooks if they go to the page that's called Deeper Dialogue, because it is very relevant to our, our conversation today. If they uh, fill out a form with their name and email address, I will send them a free chapter of my audiobook called Deeper Dialogue, and it's, it's the most recent one. So I, I'd be thrilled to be invited back. I think that there's a whole bunch of territory for you and I to explore together. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, John. I encourage my listeners to reach out, uh, take advantage of that generous offer, and I hope we have a chance to talk again soon. Uh, to everyone who's listening, I hope everyone has a great week and please stay healthy and safe.